Hello YouTube and thank you for tuning in today. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Today we're going to go over how to restore or fix bad connections on solder joints inside of these uh, vintage style speakers. Today I'm only working on one. I do have both of them today, but this is just going to be a straight up tutorial for you guys. This will make it a little bit easier if you have any problems with your speakers, if they're crackling or popping or if there's distortion and you've let's say you've troubleshooted it a bit and it's not your amplifier you have figured out maybe you've swapped the speakers and figured out one of them or maybe both of them are bad well this might lead you to a solution if you have any questions definitely comment down below as well and i'll try my best to help let's see if we can turn this thing around and get it open most of these manufacturers um, around different time periods, it completely depends on the manufacturer, but a lot of them like Pioneer, Technics, um, Panasonic, they all wired different ways depending on the design. But uh, if there was a tweeter and then there was a woofer, sometimes they'd have a capacitor in line with the tweeter for the high frequencies for when it comes in. I believe the capacitors do some kind of filtering. That's my understanding of it. It looks to me like there's just one cone in here just looking at it by eye. But we're going to open this and see what we're dealing with today. So it looks like there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws. And we can unscrew all these and this backing should lift off. Um, from my experience, some of these manufacturers uh, also had glue that would line the, uh, the inside here that would make it very difficult to, to get these backings out, near to impossible. Um, but you can heat it up. You might be able to heat up the sides, and I wouldn't pry anything. I've made the mistake of doing that myself and have broken a few of these little cabinets. Uh, luckily, I don't pay as much as some people would. Um, I don't buy as much off eBay. I go to the secondhand store and we'll go to, you know, all, all over town just looking for things from yard sales or thrift stores all over. So it's uh, it's really a fun thing to do. All right, in this design, I just removed all of the screws. Uh, in this specific design, the manufacturer has actually left us a really easy way to access the inside chassis here. And we'll get to work on this woofer here in a minute. You might notice that these, it looks like little uh, screws are through the front and then there's little nuts here on the end that lock each one into place uh, this is because these are actually when they're serviced as obviously it's serviceable it's got screws not every speaker has that some of them were completely sealed where you'd have to kick in the back just to get into them which was horrible um, and then they couldn't really be serviced they just want you to go out and buy new ones a uh, rca was very uh, common with that design, but I'm not going to say all their stuff is horrible. I mean, I'm sure they've made some decent design stuff for sure. They have stapled in the wire right here, which is good. So if you're pulling it or somebody yanks it or somebody, you know, moves it or steps on the cord, it's not going to rip right out and destroy our connections. Our connections look a little dry to me by eye, and I can kind of feel it when I'm moving them with my finger. Um, that would definitely, this really preferably we should really cut this restrip it tin it a little bit with the solder and then solder it back on directly to the terminal that would definitely uh, enhance our quality quite a bit but a lot of people will just heat this up with a hair dryer or do something but that doesn't really get the full effect of uh, quality especially with the type of gate you have to consider the gauge of wire like i said some people uh, and even me, I was considering uh, swapping out the wire, but I do love how much we actually have here. And the other one sounds quite decent, so I'm thinking this one's just a bad connection situation, which is, you know, uh, it's, it could possibly be the voice coil of the speaker. Uh, if the voice coil was shot, it would it might sound really horrible. I mean, you'll know if you have a, a really bad voice coil. Some people play their speakers beyond the point of where they just start smoking. And that, that can be a, a pretty dangerous situation. You know, your speakers don't take DC. DC isn't good for them because DC is only one direction. Uh, your speakers take AC, so they're moving back and forth, like uh, alternating current back and forth. So, and we'll see if we could get this one out to work on it. I'd rather not stick my iron in here and try to force it and then miss and make a hole in the woofer. That's going to be a whole other issue. And then you'd have to replace the whole assembly. Uh, or maybe glue it or something, but 
we'll definitely see if we can get this out and see if I can get a better view and working on it. My apologies for the camera angles and everything. I don't currently have a mount, so I'm holding my phone here. We'll see if we can get it out. In case you're wondering, the front of this speaker does not come out. Um, you will destroy it trying to get this out. These were not meant to be open from the front. These specific uh, ARS brand speakers. Um, somebody told me that these might be ABS speakers. Um, but I personally, I believe I looked it up and I couldn't find anything on it, but I may be wrong. But ARS has made a lot of good things and I've, I've found decent speakers. I know people that hate Japanese speakers uh, with a passion, all of them. But anyway, aside from that, uh, I just, I love how they sound. I think they're fantastic, uh, paper cone woofers. And if you don't use them and it's paper cone um, and you just let them sit, uh, the paper will actually, it can actually rot. Um, and it can actually just completely fall apart. I've had a lot of them where I've found them and they just fall apart after just leaving them in storage for even something like a couple of years, like three to five years, they'll just fall apart if you don't use them. So uh, that's my experience with it at least. All right, just removed another bolt to my socket wrench and they had little washers, of course, in there too that they were secured on. I assume that they're in between where the nut and the connector is here, probably to reduce vibration and maybe noise while the speaker is moving. It should lift right up for us here. Uh, you're not going to be able to lift it past that. Remember, it's stapled in. So we can actually take a look at it from the front. I see a little tear. There's a very tiny imperfection right there. That could be glued. That's not detrimental. There's no really bad tears in the cone itself. It's actually quite nice. I just really like the style and the sound of these. Uh, check your, if you're having problems, but not with the woofer, and maybe the middle section sometimes you'll have, there's a lot of uh, Radio Shack woofers have it. I think it was Americana speaker, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's Americana speakers. There's only like a handful of them left. I have one pair of them, and one of them was buzzing really bad when I would turn up uh, volume on my receiver. And it wasn't the actual channel itself. I swapped it, did all the troubleshooting. And it was actually the connection to the tweeter that was on there. So definitely check your internal connections too that are actually ran from the connections to the actual cone that's back there that follows on these wires that are drooped back to the cone. Sometimes they'll get two there to the woofer. This one's just the woofer. But then you'll have another section where they will be running up to, uh, you know, if it's like full range plus a tweeter in the middle, sometimes they'll get two more of those wires that are running somewhere else. And follow them and see if you can get your iron in there to redo those connections. For sure, that would probably fix it. All right, I came up with the idea of putting the backing sideways and putting the speaker on top so I can have access to the connections and move it around if I need to. Uh, a lot of people will just work on these. Of course, there's enough room in there. You know, you could get your iron in there and all that. I just, I just don't want to take the risk with stabbing into these holes or something like that. So definitely want to redo these. Both of them look a little, a little suspicious. They're not horrible. They're not the most bad connections I've ever seen but where these go here and they follow to the cone and then these are you know the wire that you connect to an amp or receiver and I'll see if I can redo those all right so this is what I've come up with you may hear a little bit of noise that's my vent station I use a Milwaukee uh, job site fan to take away the lead solder fumes i don't use lead free i do use lead solder and it's always important it is top priority to me is safety um, and it should be for you too you shouldn't be breathing anything other than air into your lungs so definitely take the precaution of getting a vent station or wearing a mask um, if you're brand new to this i would highly recommend wearing goggles or uh, some sort of glasses or something like that you definitely don't want to be messing around uh, a soldering iron is not a toy it's something that can burn you very bad it's happened to me a number of times it's um, it's something that you know I think we all go through especially if you're willing to learn we make mistakes and that's okay it doesn't matter that you know you fail sometimes it matters that you learn something from it uh, if you're first starting they probably include a sponge in your kit with your soldering iron tip size is also important whenever you're soldering 
definitely want to make sure we have a good size for it. It'll apply appropriate heat and it should start flowing quite well. I'm first going to start on the connections that run over to the cone. We don't want to stay here too long to the point where it burns off though. Let's see if we get a little bit on here and see if it will start to flow. You can solder anywhere from 350 degrees to 400 degrees Celsius. That's on the high side for a lot of people. They don't usually like to go that high. To make flowing a little bit easier, you can also use a little bit of flux. There is flux in the solder, I believe, within itself. But it's nice to have liquid flux that you can apply. I see this connection is kind of sticking out here. Like a sore thumb. I'm going to pull that in a little bit. Really connect it. Always pay attention to where your thumb is at. That's what all I have to say. If you poke yourself with this when you're soldering, it burns. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just telling you, it does hurt. Let's apply a little bit more solder to this joint here. Let it naturally cool while attempting to hold it in place. I do have a helping hands unit that helps me hold things in place. In this instance, I'm just using my finger to hold them. Connections look a little bit better than they did before. Try not to get too perfectionistic about it. Sometimes all it takes is a little reflow. And when I say reflow, I don't mean just touching your iron to the terminal and letting it reflow itself because you never know if the solder uh, is going to make an adequate connection. I just add, just I mean, I say just add a little bit more because some people believe that reflowing doesn't work. I'm not one of those people. I believe that if you touch a connection and you try your best and you add a little bit of solder, that your connection might get fixed. But is that connection really your problem? Well, I don't know. Have you done all the troubleshooting? Have you gone to the receiver amp and checked all the voltages? Have you opened it? Have you tested for you know, continuity in certain areas, have you made sure it's got a good ground? You have to ask yourself all those questions before, you know, getting right in and saying, well, this is definitely my problem. You know, try to verify the problem, of course. When putting back your iron, be sure to add just a little bit of solder on it and tin the tip and get one of these. They're fantastic. The brass, I think it's, it's not a sponge. You don't wet it down. It's just, uh, it's brass. It's like a housing. It comes with it. You can get these on uh, on Amazon. But these connections look a little bit better now. If you're worried about the smear, you see the kind of the orange brownish look. Uh, I've always known that to be, I believe it's rosin. Or maybe the flux that's in the solder. I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, if you're worried about it though, you can still get it out. Let me show you here. I use 99% isopropyl. Uh, in this bottle here, I actually only have 91%, but we'll see if it does the trick. If you're worried about the actual cone, you can put a separation barrier between the connections point and the cone, because isopropyl can do some detrimental things uh, to different materials, so definitely have to be careful with that. I probably should have laid that there beforehand just to be sure, but you never know how much it's going to come off. I use a little brush and just brush my connections, and this kind of kind of helps clean up the area. Some flux says no clean, but sometimes you have to clean it off anyway. I always clean it off, you know, just to make sure there's nothing sticky or anything bad on the board. So now you can see the connections are a lot cleaner. We can move it. We don't see any movement in the end connection. That's good. Kind of hold it with my hand so it doesn't jiggle as much of the cone. It's real good. So to test to make sure your speaker is all right and that it's working in some way, shape, or form that you're making a connection, you can take your wire and you can touch the terminals of the battery. Now pay attention to which way it moves because if you have the negative which actually is this one in my hands, and you put it to the positive, 
which is wrong, the wrong polarity, negative to positive, positive to negative, it's pulling back on the speaker. It pulls backwards. That's the wrong polarity. So if you're never sure on what way your speakers are supposed to be moving, take the wires and just touch them to a battery. And if you got the polarity correct, this is the positive, this is the negative, right? This is the negative, this is the positive. They're the right ones on the right terminals. It moves outward. That's how you know if the polarity is correct. Well, that's how you test that. Just be sure never to connect a battery live with your wires and cut them somewhere down the line where they're still connected to your amper receiver. DC this high would definitely trigger your protection circuit and could even short an output transistor on the amplifier. Definitely would be a problem. I'm really hoping that this video will find someone that really needs help with something. You know, sometimes we just, we encounter stuff with electronics. They're just, they can be unpredictable sometimes. And it's important to know how to maintain them. And not everyone cares about it. Uh, you know, some people just say, toss it to the curb. You know, I'm done. Or uh, they give it up to Goodwill, which I've, I've supported them for a while, Goodwill. Um, that's where I get a lot of stuff. You know, I like the thrift stores and stuff, of course, as well. But recently, I've seen a lot of stuff from Goodwill. I have just been shocked. I've gone in some Goodwills and found shoes for $60 that really, in reality, aren't worth more than 20 I mean, you really got to be careful how much you're paying for things. Make sure to definitely do your research and, you know, find out all about that kind of stuff. Because you never know how much they're really, if they're price gouging or if they're giving you an honest price. I've found quite a few receivers and speakers in there for close into the $300, $400 range at certain locations, which are way too much. I've never paid anything like that for mine, though. Um, this one specifically, the pair that I have of these was only, I think, $5? $5, $7? It was something like that. They weren't that much. They were worth it to me, and they sound great, and I'm confident this one's going to sound good, so we'll go test it out. We're in the Custom Music Masterpieces playlist and we are listening to a Spongebob rooftop rumble soundtrack. We're working off a Yamaha A720 for the sound. Well, guys it definitely sounds fantastic sounds a lot better than it did when I was using it before um, both of them preferably uh, should probably have you know this one's got the connections done so the other one probably should as well um, if your speakers are having any problems at all as you can see I have too many out here in the garage and I know some people are probably going to say something about the Yamaha yes why is it in the garage why is it there I know people love these uh, they are fantastic I'm a Yamaha guy myself I love them this line specifically has a problem with the digital signal processor that's down on the board there's actually a see the metal heat sink on top of it that was never there um, I have worked on this receiver and uh, had to do multiple things to get it to come back to working order. Some receivers you just can't fix. But for anybody wondering why it's out here, I'm not going to say, you know, I don't care about it or, you know, it deserves to be out here or whatever because, you know, I know some people have just thrown these things straight away. But what happened uh, basically is it started losing sound. You know, the speaker grid would disappear. The relays wouldn't click in. All the symptoms of the no sound problem. Ankyo was plagued with it years ago. They had bad capacitors, bad uh chips they're all made by most of them maybe not all of them but most of them are made by texas instruments i've actually never come into contact with one that was not made by texas instruments so that's why i believe all of them were uh, a lot of these chips they recalled after these units were already manufactured and they got out and people used them and then the dsp problem would happen where it would start disappearing I've had it out here for a while, um, nearly six months now, and it has never encountered the issue again after putting the heat sink on. If it does, I'm going to have to do a little more work on it and probably put a fan on top of it that sucks air out and preferably maybe even some underneath if I can get it jacked up a little bit. Um, this isn't the best way to put something out here, you know, in a garage, no stand, uh, no fans on it, I understand. Um, it's also the same way with a computer, so... 
Um, both the speakers and everything, they're used quite frequently when I'm out here. I hope that they don't go bad because like I said, sometimes when you keep speakers in storage for years and years and you don't use them, uh, they end up failing, especially paper cones specifically. Um, I think the other type might be poly. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from it. And if you have any questions, comments, anything about receivers, speakers, audio equipment, electronics in general, if your TV won't power on, just leave a comment below and I'll see if I can maybe guide you in the right direction. I'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.